Pray with me, would you please? Thank you, Father, for who you are. Thank you for the wonderful songs we've been singing about the glory of Christ, about the person and work of Christ. And I pray that once more today you will bring this home to us in a powerful way, not only through the music, but through the teaching of your word. Thank you that uh, Jesse has interrupted our thoughts of ball games and, uh, and parties and uh, other things that we do in your name, which are perfectly fine and can be glorious opportunities to share you with others as well. But Lord, it's a reminder of where reality is. And sometimes in our country, we are far removed from reality. We thank you for those who protect our freedoms and we pray that you will protect them as they are in various parts of the world facing imminent danger every day. We thank you for those who are serving you in far-flung places as we think of the Losis, we think of uh, Bob and Ellen closer to home, but sharing you with foster families. We think of Bob and Jan and sharing your word through the ministry of Far East Broadcasting. And Lord, we, we pray for all of these that you will that you will be glorified in their ministries. Lord, we pray most of all for those who are suffering huge loss from a human perspective. We pray that they will have visions and understanding of heaven and of glory like we seldom have so that they will get what this passage that we're looking at is trying to teach us. It's all worth it in the end. But Father, help us to be sensitive to what's going on in our world in the meantime, to pray for these, to be concerned about them, and to do whatever we can to help. Lord, we thank you the day is coming when you will overcome all the darkness and evil in the world. Thank you for the justice of God, which guarantees that that will be the case. Bless us as we contemplate today your word in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, turn with me if you're not already there to Luke chapter nine, Luke chapter nine. Steve, uh, Steve Jobs, one of the most innovative technologists really of our time, founded Apple Computer back in the early to mid 80s. Some of you probably are aware that he died of pancreatic cancer in 2011 at the age of 56. He apparently died of, with little hope, as best I can tell, some of the statements that he made. One of them went like this, speaking of the possibility of an afterlife. He said this, he said, sometimes I think it's like an on-off switch. Click, and you're gone. And that's why I don't like putting on-off switches on Apple devices. I thought it was interesting it's an interesting revelation that what we believe affects <laughs> everything. Are we safe? <laughs> Who knows? What we believe affects everything we do, including the design of computers, apparently. Because if you have no hope beyond this life, you are indeed a tragic person. And all you can do is try and get the most out of what you can now, and then when it's cut short, now what do you do? I think, I think the whole idea and the whole subject of the afterlife is very confusing to a lot of people. There's a lot of reasons for that. Sometimes the way we teach children leaves a lot to be desired. I heard of one little four-year-old girl named Nancy. She was on the way to a funeral for her grandfather holding a bouquet of flowers and being confused about what the whole thing of death was. She turned to her mother and said, well, will, 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 will grandpa turn into a flower? And her mother thought, oh, this is a really good, great way to ease the pain. She said, why, Nancy, that's a lovely thought that grandpa would turn into a flower. So the little girl looked at the rest of the flowers in the bouquet and she said, well, then who are all these people? <laughs> that's a good way to confuse somebody, is it not? About the afterlife. 
I suspect that the prospect of becoming a flower didn't do much to enhance Nancy's appreciation for what might come next, right? Neither, for many of us, does the concept of sitting on a cloud and playing a harp, uh, singing praise songs all day long, maybe a few would, could get into that at least for a couple hours, but all the time, our views of heaven skew our the reality of what it really is. And so many, you've heard them, I've heard them say, well, forget heaven, I'll just go to hell and be with my friends. Revealing that they have no real understanding of either place. But we should, because it isn't gonna be very many years, beloved, and we'll all be in one place or the other. Don't you wanna know where you're going? So this passage helps, the passage of the transfiguration that we've been looking at, verses 28 through 36 of Luke 9. The main message, which we have stressed the last three weeks, is that while the kingdom of God is glorious, there's a high cost for entrance. It costs Jesus his very life to provide the possibility of payment for the sins that belong to us. It costs those who will receive him in his words that they must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow him. There's a high cost that attaches to that. And so we're learning through this passage that death is the entrance to life, both for him and for us. The cross precedes the crown, but the price at the end of the day is worth it. That's where God is going with this. And so we've looked at the passage, first of all, from the standpoint of the purpose of the passage to encourage the disciples and to encourage Jesus that what comes after is going to be worth the hardship that's going to come before. And then we looked at the person of the preview where we saw the supremacy of the person and the work of Jesus Christ, the importance of all of that. So that's the main point. But I want the next two weeks, we're going to look at the, some portents, portents of the preview. That is, things that tell us a little bit about what heaven is like, some of the basics. This isn't in great detail, but as a kind of a sidelight here, because this is a glimpse of the kingdom, there are some kingdom conditions that give us some insight into what heaven will really be like. Now, I want to start this with the, with the first, what I think is a very important question, which is, is there really an afterlife? Many people would have us believe from a naturalistic perspective that you live, you die, and that's it. All conscience existence is gone. Is there really an afterlife? This is the thing that Steve Jobs apparently could not really get his arms around. And part of the reason for that is if you are a naturalist, if you just believe that what is is what we see and touch and sense with our five senses, there's no way to prove one way or the other about an afterlife. It's only if we really do have a revelation from a God who inhabits eternity that we would know. But that's what the Bible purports to be. And a lot of good evidence that that's exactly what it is. And from this passage of Scripture, the answer to that question, is there an afterlife, is very definitely yes, there is an afterlife. When the disciples wake up from their little nap after Jesus has taken them up on the mountain, there sits Jesus in a dazzling display of glory indicating not only who he was inherently, but who he will be forever. And he's talking to two men from heaven. He's talking to two men who have come from the afterlife. He's talking to two men who have come from beyond. I don't know about you, but one of the, one of the things I love about the Bible is, is how casually it takes the most extraordinary events. Have you ever noticed that? It just talks about angels. I mean. You know, like, well, they're just real, they're there. It doesn't try and explain them. It just takes for granted, these spirit beings. It talks about creation, which men have written tomes about. And we have people today studying to try and understand what was created, how did this all come into being in the first place? The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Ten words, 
And it takes care of the whole thing. Six words if you're reading it in Hebrew like Jesse does. That's the answer God gives. He doesn't try and explain himself. He doesn't try and defend who he is or where he came from or what's, what that's all about. He doesn't go into the complexities of the universe. He just says, hey, you see it? I did it. it takes for granted these wonderful, stupendous happenings, which if you really st stand back and think about it, is exactly what you might expect of an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God, right? He doesn't have to explain himself to anybody, and the Bible is filled with the evidence that he doesn't bother. He just takes for granted the realities that are there. And that's what he does here in Luke 9, verse 30. It says, and behold, two men were talking with Jesus here, Moses and Elijah. So there they are, two guys who've been gone from the scene for hundreds of years, talking with Jesus. The Bible doesn't bother to explain it, doesn't even tell us where they came from. We infer that from other passages of Scripture, it just assumes it. But the answer to the question, is there an afterlife, is very clearly implied in their presence, is it not? Yes, there is an afterlife. And here is living, breathing proof. Here's two men who have come from there. The Bible doesn't think there is an afterlife, it knows that there is an afterlife. Thankfully, it also helps us understand how to be prepared for that afterlife. But you know, it's not just the Word of God that reveals this. I, I really believe that God has put within, within every one of us just a, a sense within our very self that there's something more than just what we experience here and now. And with our five senses, virtually every culture in history, the only possible exception being maybe some of the atheistic, communistic cultures of the 20th century, which by the way, haven't lasted very long. Virtually every culture in history has had some concept of God, some concept of an afterlife, some concept of something coming later. Where did it all come from? Ever since the fall, we have been a displaced people, according to the Bible, looking for home. C.S. Lewis says this. He says, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the probable explanation is that I was made for another world. And that's a sense that he builds upon in many of his writings. He's saying our very nature cries out that there must be more. Some of you are familiar with the Narnia Chronicles, uh, these children's books that C.S. Lewis wrote. In the, in the very first book, you'll remember that he has this white witch who represents Satan. And then this white witch has a stranglehold on Narnia, which represents our world, the world in which we live, and Lewis describes the conditions in Narnia as being always winter, but never Christmas. In other words, yeah, you kind of live, but it's not a very wonderful existence. It's kind of cold and forbearing and not what you would expect. But a thaw is expected when the great lion Aslan, representing Christ, is rumored or predicted to come at which time he will give his life to atone for people's sins, will rise again, and will eventually take the throne. Meantime, Lewis refers to this world as the Shadowlands. What he's saying is what we experience here is just a glimpse of what we really were made for, of where history is really going as we await the redemption of Christ. So both God's word and God's world, I think, expect a future life, a future existence. But the word, the word of God, always speaks of that future existence with two possible destinies, does it not? Always two. Two possible destinies. Heaven is available to those who have made Jesus as their king now in this life. But Jesus issues constant warnings for those who will not do that. For example, Matthew 7, 
Verses 13 and 14, where he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Don't you, don't you want to be one of the few that enters by the narrow gate? The presence of Moses and Elijah here on this mountain are proof positive that the thaw is coming. We've already seen the first part of it. We've seen the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ fulfilled historically, just exactly as the Old Testament said it would be. And so we have every reason to believe that that second coming when the thaw will be complete is on its way, that just as Jesus came once, he will come again, just as realistically, just as thoroughly, just as wonderfully as he came the first time. Is there an afterlife? Absolutely, that's the Bible's answer. Second question, what's the best thing about the kingdom? What's the best thing about the kingdom? A lot of wonderful things about the kingdom, but you know what the best thing about the kingdom is? Jesus. Jesus is going to be the best thing about the kingdom. God's revelation of himself in Jesus is far and away the best thing about the kingdom. He's the one on this mountain, on this mountain of transfiguration. He's the one whose face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. He's the one whose departure is being discussed in such intense detail. He's the one about whom the Father says, this is my son, my chosen one, listen To him, he's the center of everything that's going on on the top of this mountain, which represents a preview of the kingdom of God. What does that tell us about the kingdom? Jesus is central to everything. Listen, listen, beloved. Let me tell you, when when, when we see Jesus face to face, when we see Jesus face to face, every other thought, every other desire, every other intention, every other distraction, will be gone in an instant, and it will stay that way forever. So why don't we start to live that way now? That's the way heaven's going to be. You know, over the course of about a 30-year business career, I started to try and add this up one time. I figured I traveled somewhere between four and five million miles, closer to five, I think, than four. But I can tell you this, the best part of every single trip, regardless of how far away from home, regardless of how long I'd been away, was the night I was packing to go home. It didn't matter what had happened that was good or bad on that trip. It didn't matter what problems had gotten resolved or not resolved, whatever had gone on. It never dulled my anticipation as I packed my bag to go home that last night. Most times I didn't sleep very well that night. Why? Why? Because I was anxious to see my house in California, because I couldn't wait to get back to the car, because I loved the LA smog so much that I couldn't wait to breathe that again, real air. I mean, of course, it was none of those things. What made home home was my wife at the other end and my family at the other end. I couldn't wait to get back and see Patty and see the rest of the family. It was precious, that's what made home precious. And that's the way heaven, beloved, should be for us. It's the anticipation of seeing the one who has saved us, the one who is our Lord. That's what heaven is about. You know, I I wonder, are you far enough along in your Christian experience to really begin to appreciate how wonderful Jesus is? It, It gets a little easier as you get older. I'm not that old, but it's starting to get easier. It gets easier because, you know, friends and loved ones die. They pass away. Other ones you lose contact with for one reason or another. Somebody's, you know, just moved away and gone, and you keep in touch for a little bit, and then you lose contact. Others, you just lose contact because you're just running in different circles. And then a few times, somebody betrays you, right? But who's the friend who sticks closer than any brother According to Proverbs 18, 24, it's our Lord Jesus Christ, right? He's the one that you can count on when everyone else fails. And I hope you're beginning to sense that as this life closes in, you know, as it begins to fade, as you begin to realize it's not going to last forever, 
Has that realization hit you yet? It needs to. It's not going to last forever. There's someone who will. And we should begin to look forward to seeing Jesus, to being with him. I, I tell you, I, you know what? I, because I know Jesus, according to the teaching of the Bible, came in the body of a man. He's, he still is in that body. That's the way we're going to see him one of these days, greatly enhanced with the dazzling glory that's his. But, you know, I've gotten to the place where I wonder how tall he is. What's he going to look like? What will it feel like to just see him, let alone touch him? What will it be to be with Jesus? We, we wonder what he'll be. I look forward to seeing Jesus. You know, there are a lot of reasons why Jesus is central to the kingdom. I'm just, let me just mention two this morning. Jesus is central. He's the best thing about heaven, first of all, because he's the, he's the key to entrance. He's the key to entrance. There's no, there's no getting in without him. That's why one thing, notice, we've looked at this in the last couple of weeks, but one thing occupied Moses and Elijah and Jesus. Look at verse 30, 31. They spoke or were speaking literally of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. It was Jesus' departure, that is his death, his resurrection and his ascension that occupied their minds. They weren't talking about the wonderful exploits that Elijah and Moses had accomplished here on earth. They were talking about one thing. They were talking about the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, the departure of Jesus. Why? Because that was the key to entrance. Again, as we've said before, Moses knew full well that even though he had come from heaven, he, didn't, he had no business there. He had no right to be there. You say, wait a minute, this, that, that was one of, how could you say that? That was one of God's great servants, and he was. From a human standpoint, Moses was a great man, right? Moses was the man through whom God brought the greatest deliverance in history, the, Egyptian, uh, the, the Israelites leaving Egypt under the direction of Moses as the instrument of God to bring this all about, the greatest picture we have in the Bible of what salvation is all about. He's the one through whom, through whom God gave the law, the Ten Commandments and the law. But see, here's the thing we miss. Moses was also a great violator of the very law that God gave him. Moses was a murderer. He had physically, with his own hands, murdered one of the Egyptians, as many of you will remember. But listen, it was way worse than that. Way worse than that. Moses was not allowed to go into the promised land. Remember that? Why was that? That was because Moses one day struck a, walk, a rock to get water when God, told him to, when God told him to speak to the rock. Now, there are reasons for that. The rock was representing Christ and the Christ can only be crucified once. You can't strike him twice, so the symbolism was being ruined. But there was an even bigger reason. You know what it was? It was that, that Moses, in that process, was literally killing two million people. Say, so how do you say that? Because what does Jesus say when he reinterprets the law in Matthew 5? He says, if you, if you even speak in an A, if you have anger in your heart against your brother, what? It's just, just like you murdered him. He was a violator of the law. Circumcision was, with the, was at the heart, was the symbolic heart of the covenant that God made with Moses. And he didn't even circumcise his own child until God was ready. God was about to kill him, remember? And his wife came out and said, you bloody man, you better do this. Moses had no business in the presence of God because his sins hadn't been paid for yet, beloved. Yes, he offered the sacrifices that the system called for, but the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away the sins of people. It was just a way of expressing his faith that someday there would be somebody who would come, who would take away his sins, right? You say, you're way off. Well, turn with me to Galatians 3. Let me try and show it to you there. Galatians chapter 3. I have to go forward a few books. It's one of those little ones, a little harder to find. But Galatians 3. 
Galatians, of course, is all about the distinction between the law and faith and how salvation is by faith. It's not by law. It's not by works. It's not by things we can do. It's not by things we merit. And in the third chapter, Paul speaks, spends some time talking about how the Galatians have foolishly followed those who are trying to teach them that they need to work for their salvation, that they need to be circumcised, that they need to follow certain other things if they're going to actually have salvation. And then he goes into what Jesus has done in verses 10 and following, how no, that's not what happens. Jesus is the one who came and became a curse for us. The very one who knew no sin, he took all the sin upon himself. Verse 13, becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. There's where your salvation resides. But now, look how this applies when we get down to the Old Testament saints. Look, look, look beginning in verse 23. It says, now, before faith came, and you have to understand that 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 the, uh, verse 25, I'm sorry, before faith came, he's using the word faith in a, in, a, in a little bit different way here. What he's saying is those Old Testament guys had faith. So Abraham, because he believed God, his faith, it was counted to him for righteousness. But, but what he's doing here is he's personifying the faith. So the, when he says the word faith in this context, he's talking about Jesus, who is the end product of the faith, who's the one who was the object of their faith, even though they didn't know it at the time. Are you with me? So, so don't get confused at the language here, but he says, now before faith came, that is before Jesus came, the object of the faith, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming of faith, until Jesus came, till the coming of faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. No Jesus, no justification. But now that faith, the object of faith, Jesus, has come. So we are no longer under a guardian for in Christ Jesus in Christ Jesus, only in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. So what were the Old Testament saints before Jesus came? Not officially children of God, beloved, because it's only in Christ Jesus that that can happen. So do you see why Moses and Elijah were so intently talking to Jesus about his coming departure? Because if it didn't happen, they can't go back. They didn't belong in heaven. All the Old Testament guys, Moses, Elijah, David, Abraham, Hosea, Isaiah, name them, they all depended on the object of their faith showing up and becoming the sacrifice for the sin of the world, which is exactly why, which is exactly why Jesus said this in John chapter 8, verse 56. He was talking to a bunch of Jews one day and he happened to mention their father Abraham. And he says this, he says, your father Abraham rejoiced, rejoiced that he would see my day. And then he says he saw it and was glad. Why? Because salvation was at last happening. The thing that had to happen, the promise that they had believed in, the thing they had put their faith in was finally coming true. So that tells us two things about Abraham. One is it tells us he was still alive. Jesus talks about him as though he's still alive, along with Moses and Elijah. But it tells us also that he was depended on Jesus coming for his salvation. And now it's happening. And all those Old Testament prophecies and signs and the sacrificial system are coming true. No wonder that's all they talked about, right? Their eternal future depended on it. And it wasn't just theirs. Tur turn with me if you're in Galatians. Just go a little further over to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Because now Peter, one of the guys that's on that mountain with Jesus that night, 
has this to say because Jesus was the key to their salvation as well. Peter, James, and John, although they, they didn't get it yet, not that night, but later they did, and when they did, here's what Peter wrote, 2 Peter 1, beginning in verse 16. Peter says, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths. Why did he say that? Because, there was a, because, because he's, he's writing to people who are being heavily persecuted, similar to what's going on in Iraq. They were under heavy persecution. Some of them were beginning to doubt. And there were other false teachers who had come in and said, what you, you know what, all that stuff that these guys are teaching you about Christ and all that stuff, it's just fables, it's just myths. Listen to us, we'll tell you what's really the truth. And Peter's saying, we're not following clever, cleverly devised myths as though we could make them up anyway. It says, when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we were, notice this, this is so critical, we were eyewitnesses. We were eyewitnesses of what, Peter? We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. In other words, this is no fairy tale. We saw it with our own eyes. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory. Peter knew all about that because remember the cloud that came down on the mountain that night and he was right there in the middle of it? The majestic glory of God. It says, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the, vo and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this. So we're not only eyewitnesses, we heard this this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And now we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention. What he's saying is, listen, everything that was said in the Old Testament, it all came true, and we saw it. We're eyewitnesses of it. We're actually hearers of it. We're witnesses that the prophetic truth was more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Pay attention. It's the key to entrance. I'll tell you something, beloved. Our love for Jesus will be multiplied. You know, whatever it is today, I hope it's great. Hope you love Jesus. Sometimes it's hard to get your arms around a being that you haven't seen, right? But what we know of Jesus, we can love and we can appreciate, but when we see him face to face, I can tell you this, we, our love for Jesus will be multiplied a million fold when we see what he has saved us from and we see what he has saved us to. You will love Jesus. It's the best thing about heaven. He's the only way in. Spurgeon once said, he said, I looked at Christ, the dove of peace flew into my heart. I looked at the dove of peace and it flew away. He's trying to illustrate a wonderful truth. And the truth is that we sometimes get focused on the blessings of Christ and we miss the one who's giving the blessings. And he's saying that's where your attention needs to be. That's where your focus needs to be. That's the one that you need to be in love with. And his, and his, and his point is simple. You know, when we, look at it, think of it this way. When we, when we get to heaven and we look all around and there'll be all these wonderful things going on there, right? Mm -hmm. Streets of gold. Some of us, I don't know, maybe that's where we get concentrated. You know, money's been our thing. We're looking now, the streets have gold on. All these wonderful, the vivid colors, the rainbow that we were singing about earlier. Why is that there? Because the colors will be so vivid in heaven, much, much stronger than anything we've ever experienced here. We will be seeing the loved ones that have gone before us. Won't that be wonderful? It's gonna be a lot of wonderful things to see there. But listen, beloved, all those things will pale by comparison to the one who's at the center of all of this, which is Jesus. Spurgeon, I don't know if I can 
If I left the book down there, but Spurgeon said this, he said, you know, I know some of you are all excited because when you get to heaven, you think you're gonna get around all the planets and you're gonna go to Venus and you're gonna go to Mars and you're gonna see all these things. And he said, that's great. And he said, hey, if you wanna do that, more power to you. God help you to do it and he'll probably let you and you'll have a lot of fun. But he said, here's where you'll find me. I'm gonna be sitting at the feet of Jesus, just looking at him. And I think he had it right. We, we, will, we will spend eternity Experience Jesus in, a, in amazing and wonderful ways that we can't even begin to imagine because heaven is all about Jesus. He's the key to entrance. Second thing about Jesus, he lights up the whole thing. He lights up the whole thing. If you're back in Luke, chapter 9, we have this you know, wonderful statement in verse 29, as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. We've looked at why. It's, it's the deity of Christ showing through Jesus' glory as God was hidden during his earthly ministry. But now God gives this brief foretaste on the Mount of Transfiguration of who Jesus really is. One day Jesus is going to light up the whole universe now, he quit shining that night because he still had work to do. But let me tell you, after his death and resurrection and ascension, beloved, his glory returned in full force, and it returned to stay forever. Look with me at, at the book of Acts, chapter 9. If you're in Luke, just go to John and then Acts. Acts chapter 9. This is a passage I first read sometime when I was a kid and I had a slightly different understanding of it. This is when Paul, who was named Saul at the time, was out to persecute the church and so he was, he'd gotten permission to go up to Damascus, bring them back or kill them. It says in Acts chapter 9 verse 3, now as he was on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. You know, when I used to think of that, I, I think of a big flashlight. That's, that's kind of how I pictured it in my mind. Um, I, for all I know, some kids' literature that I saw maybe had it that way. I don't know, but that's what was in my mind, a big flashlight. But look at this, verse 4. And falling on the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Why did he say that? Well, because he was at a terrific disadvantage, right? He's on the ground. He's not seeing anything except this bright light. And it's a fascinating question. Who are you, Lord? Paul knew he hadn't been just hit by a big floodlight or a big flashlight. This is a person. This is some body. This light talked. This light had a voice. This light was a person. And Paul asked the logical question, who in the world are you? Let me tell you, he got an answer he didn't expect. I suspect that Paul, when he said that, might have thought he would hear, well, this is, this is God, Jehovah. This is Jehovah Jireh. This is, this is Elohim. This is El Elyon. This is, you know, any of the Old Testament names for God he might have expected he would hear. But look what he heard instead. Verse five, and he said, I am Jesus. That's not what Paul expected to hear. I'm Jesus, whom you are, by the way, persecuting. In going after my people, you're going after me. And you're gonna have to deal with me one of these days. Just like those who are killing Christians in Iraq are gonna have to deal with the Lord Jesus one of these days. You can't persecute Jesus' people without persecuting Jesus. He says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting persecuting, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. Paul was seeing the glorified Christ, the same thing that Peter and James and John had seen that night is what Paul was seeing. The light they saw has never gone out. It never will. Turn, turn to Revelation, last book in the Bible, chapter 21. Revelation 21. Revelation 21 and verse 23, look at this. It says, in the city, speaking of 
the New Jerusalem, which is another biblical term for heaven. The city has no need of sun or moon to shine in it. For the glory of God gives it light. And its lamp is the lamb. Who's the lamb? Jesus. It's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, right? By its light will the nations walk and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it and the gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there. Imagine Jesus lighting up the whole universe. Look at chapter 22, verse five. Night will be no more. They will need no light or lamp or sun for the Lord God, that's Jesus. Every knee will confess him as Lord, Philippians tells us. The Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. That's a lot of glory, isn't it? Enough to light up the whole universe forever. The light will never go out. Jesus is the center of everything. He's the reason for creation in the first place. Listen, beloved, if you're thinking you can fob Jesus off somehow, that it doesn't really matter what you do with your life, that you can just sort of say, well, yeah, I believe he came, but it doesn't mean anything in your daily life. If you believe that, you've never really examined what the Bible is about. You don't understand what Jesus meant when he keeps saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is what he's saying. There's nobody more important than Jesus. There's nobody supreme like Jesus is. The Bible tells us that everything was created by and for him. Listen to this, Colossians 1.16. It says, for by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, with the thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities. All things were created through him and for him you down to verse 18 in that chapter. He is the, be, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. If you think he was just some hippie preacher back in the first century and it didn't mean anything to life now, you are so sadly mistaken. And I beg you, please reconsider what you think of Jesus. He's the center of everything. He's the glory of God and he will be the center of our whole existence in the kingdom of God or he will be the one from whose presence you are excluded forever because you chose against him by your apathy and indifference. For those of you who are believers, here's a, here's a little kind of a well-kept secret, although it's there in the Bible. It says in Matthew 13, verse 43, then the righteous, that's those who are part of the kingdom, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. We're gonna be little bright lights reflecting the glory of Christ, even then reflectors of his glory. I'll tell you, it all emanates from him. It all revolves around him. It all starts with him. That means that everything we thought was important down here is gonna look pretty insignificant up there. But you know, we don't have to wait to live a Christ-centered existence. In fact, we best not. It should drive everything we, our life is about here. John said that in 1 John 3, verse two and three, he says, beloved, we are God's children, those who are believers. We are God's children now. What we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Perfection awaits those who are believers, those who are coming. And then he says this in verse three, he says, everyone who, has, who thus hopes in him purifies himself now as he is pure. If there's no desire in your heart, to live a godly life, if there's no desire for purity, if that just seems like you know Sunday school stuff, great for the kids, means nothing to me, you can't possibly belong to Christ. John says that's the great hope that causes me to want to be like him now, is knowing that I'm gonna be like him later. Drives my existence. That's why, Paul, that's why Paul could say for me to live is Christ, to die is gain, but to live is 
Paul said in Philippians 3.8, indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. Because you can take all the rest of it away. I want to know Christ. A glimpse of the kingdom should push us toward a God-centered existence, knowing what's coming should drive us to loving obedience right now. Let me close with this little account, just a simple story. A pastor named Ray Pritchard, some of you may have read some of his books, but he tells the story about a 26-year-old young man who died, cancer. He'd grown up in a Christian home, but he did what many do in his late teenage years. He rebelled, left the faith, strayed from the Lord. Wasn't too many years later, he suddenly was diagnosed with a brain tumor. They operated, he went into remission, but it was only for a short time and the cancer returned. It all brought a whole new focus to his life. Everything changed. He began to think about the faith he had left. He began to study the word. The word became sweet to him as the way the account said. He wanted the Bible, he wanted the word, he became such a follower of Jesus, he just wanted to tell about it to everybody that he ran into. He wanted his friends to know it became real to him. Changed his life. His sister said this at his funeral. Little sister, she said, she said concerning her big brother, she said how much she loved her brother and how much she wanted to be like him when she was small, but she said, you know, he could really be exas exasperating at times. But she said when he went through this cancer, a profound change came into his life. He, it, was, it was like he got a grip on what is really real, on what reality is. And then she said this. She said, he said, life is nothing without Christ. Life is nothing without Christ. I have to believe that if you ask Steve Jobs today, How did you like being the guy that invented Apple computers and did all these wonderfully innovative things and had this great mind that was admired? I think he would say life is nothing without Christ. Because he knows now what it would appear he didn't know in this life. So my question is, have you realized now that life is nothing without Christ? The Bible says in John 1, 9, that even though Jesus wasn't lit up like a light bulb for any time in his earthly life except that one time on that mountain to reveal who he really was, but it still says in John 1, 9 that he is the true light which, lights, which gives light to everyone that was coming into the world. It says Jesus was the one and he was the light. He's the one whose message we are to hear. That's why Jesus kept saying, who has ears to hear, let him hear. But he also tells us in John three nineteen that many rejected the light because why? Because their deeds were evil. That doesn't mean they were evil people. He said that to the churchgoers. He said that to the people that sat in the pews every week and were giving the money and all the rest of it. He said it to those, however, who were apathetic toward him, who rejected him as a person. The greatest sin there is, is to reject Jesus. Have you learned that life is nothing without Christ? Listen. Jesus makes all the difference. Life is nothing without Christ, but I'll tell you what, life is everything with him. I hope you know him. Let's pray. Father God, I'm reminded of that passage in John 17, three, where you said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So no Jesus, no salvation, no commitment, no assurance at all of salvation or of heaven. Daily life lived as though Jesus doesn't matter is a rejection. So Lord, open our hearts this morning. Father, those who belong to you, I pray that you will do as you said in Romans where you said 
Your spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Bring great assurance into those lives. Cause them to rejoice in what they have in you. Cause them to look forward with anticipation to the day when they will see you face to face and be like you. Send us away with that kind of glory in the background. Lord, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, please open that heart right now. Say, so you know what, I, I, I see that I need Jesus. I want Jesus. I want him more than I want any of these other things that are going to disappear before long. I want Jesus. May it be true, I pray. Even as we sing this closing song, help our hearts to open to you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.